I thought it would be kind of useful, um, partly because I've been thinking about this lately, and uh, in a few weeks I'm going to uh, the California equivalent of this group, um, and uh, they wanted me to talk about something, and so I was thinking about things. I was thinking, well, I've been doing this for a while now, and I've actually tried a lot of different ways to put bales in a wall. <laughs> And that perhaps it would be um, useful for me and maybe other people to look at all of those different ways and sort of try to figure out which, what ones work really well, uh, what ones work well for certain applications and not for others, uh, which ones should maybe go by the wayside, and, and all that kind of stuff. So um, basically, yeah, 12 straw bale wall systems ends up being the number, um, you know, there are a lot of variations of the things I'm going to show you, but essentially uh, these are the ones that, uh, that I've had experience with, um, sort of, you know, both on the coming up with the design side of things and also the building of them. So I feel like I, I sort of know the ups and downs of these ones, um, but I left a bunch of room in here for discussion too. So what I really want to kind of do is, is outline these ones, talk a little bit about them, and then um, open the floor to discussions or brawls, whichever, you know, <laughs> end up occurring um, as people discuss, you know, how they do things and, and what they don't like. So the one thing that I have seen with straw bale building is that for as many people who go through the process and really like it, and come out the other end thinking this was a good thing to do and I would repeat it or I would encourage other people to repeat it. There are just as many people who get to the end of it and not that they don't end up with a good house, but they end up with the feeling like, God, that was a lot of work or this didn't turn out the way I thought or, you know, they see drawbacks to it. And so for the purposes of this presentation, I, I, I call them sad straw balers and happy straw balers. <laughs> and what we, what we want is as many happy straw balers as possible. We want people to come through this process and, and want to recommend it and want to spread it. Um, even if they don't ever want to build another one themselves, we want them to tell people this was a good thing to do. Um, because every time somebody has the opposite experience, every time there's a sad straw baler, that, that sort of, it's a knock to all of us because they will actively tell people, no, don't do that. Um, and that, in some ways, has more influence on people trying to decide whether to do it or not than the people saying it was a great idea. Um, you know, one experienced naysayer can sort of undo uh, a whole lot of experienced um, enthusiasts. There we go. So at the beginning of this, I was thinking, well, you know, the, to get right back to the basics, why do we even do this in the first place? Like, why, why bother stuffing straw bales in a wall and smearing some stuff on them and calling it a house? And, you know, I got drawn into this uh, for this list of reasons, and I think it's pretty much the list of reasons that, you know, um, for one way or another draws us all in, and that is... Um, you get a good insulation value, you can make an energy efficient building, so that's one reason to do it. Um, it's a low embodied energy, or it can be a low embodied energy way of doing things. Um, the cost can be low, or at least the, the material cost can be low. Uh, you're using a renewable material. Um, we're told it's easy or straightforward to, to build. Um, you end up with a permeable or sort of healthy wall system, and you get a sort of unique aesthetic quality out of it. So. Those are kind of the things that, you know, from the first time I read, you know, the Straw Bale House book and got all psyched on doing this, those were the selling features. Um, so the, the point of going through this exercise for myself is to look and go, okay, this is what we tell people this is all about. Are the things we're actually building doing that? Um, because if they're not, then, you know, we're, we're, we're selling people an idea and then selling them short on the, on the final product. Um, so that's what I just said, but in other words, <laughs> so, um, it's 
good when your presentation actually follows your stream of thought pretty well. But, okay. So the, the, the thing that's really difficult when somebody gets interested in straw bale building or one person talks to another person about straw bale building is that you can't even really say straw bale building because it could be, you know, it, it, that represents a, a really wide range of approaches. Um, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of them out there. Uh, I mean, I'm going to look at 12. There are, I'm sure, some others. Um, and within those 12, there's infinite variations in those. So, you know, the question of, of it came up earlier today too, I think you were saying, like, let's not, let's not make a system that everybody has to follow, and I'm, I totally believe that. But there's, if there is no system, it also means there's sort of an infinite number of ways people can go wrong. So um, it, it definitely can happen. And for the purposes of this talk, wrong can be the house fails. That doesn't actually happen very often. Um, for me, wrong is that it makes for builders uh, and owners who won't recommend the system again. So you can end up with a super energy efficient house. Um, it could have been relatively close to its budget, it, low energy, like there can be lots of good things about it, but if in the end of the process the owner and or the builder won't want to do it again or would actively tell people, no, don't go, don't do that, you know, it wasn't worth it, um, that's that, you know, we're doing something wrong if that's the case. So I'm going to sort of dive in here. Um, I'm not going to spend a ton of, tons of time um, on the particular details of any of these systems because there are so many ways to do them. Um, so I have some illustrations up there just to sort of give people a, a general sense of what it is and you probably for the most part know what these are. Um, so you know I don't want to spend a lot of time. I'm not, this isn't a how to do all of these things. This is just a, this is what it is. Um, so the first one is, is timber frame and or sort of heavy post and beam. So you know, whether or not you're using traditional joinery or metal plates or something like that. Um, basically, big hunks of wood, that's a structural frame, and a bale wall goes up sort of typically uh, around the outside of it. Um, plaster often finishes up to the edges of posts and beams. Um, posts sit on footings that are sort of independent from the wall or, or, or um, uh, not in line with the wall, and the frame's carrying all the loads. So that's the, that's the sort of basics of that system. Oh look at that beautiful picture from dwellings that I found online <laughs> and put in my presentation but I made sure your name was on it. So, <laughs> um, so this approach um, and instead of instead of saying you know that, that it had like good points, bad points or pluses or minuses um, I think of them as upsides, like things that are inherently positive about doing it that way, and cautionary items. So nothing on this list is a bad thing or a reason not to do it, but it's things that you should be aware, if you're recommending this to a client or looking at this for yourself, that these are things that are involved in this process. And some of them might deter you from doing it, and some of them you might go, well, that's exactly why I want to do it. So you know, they're not, it's not good and bad, it's just um, sort of yeah, inherently positive things and, and things to be aware of. So with, with this kind of frame system, um, you get roof protection while you're bailing, which is always good. Um, the frames are durable, so, you know, if in a hundred years somebody doesn't want straw bale walls anymore, it's pretty easy to take the walls out and do whatever's going down in a hundred years, um, and the frame will still be viable. The aesthetic is really appealing to lots of people. Um, the bale walls can typically be put up, um, they're put up outside the frame, so you're not, you're not sort of trying to fit bales around a frame or, or notch them uh, to the frame or anything like that. Um, and the frame, because in particular corners and stuff have posts in them, they make nice guides for, for stacking, so it, it makes for a pretty easy bale raising. On the cautionary side, there's a lot of finicky air sealing details that have to happen when you're butting plaster up to timber frames. I think before people were really thinking about that, um, a lot of really leaky um, and, and you know, inefficient bale houses got made um, or had to be fixed with caulking or other sort of you know, stopgap solutions. Um, so that's sort of inherent in that system. 
the the way the the foundation piers are kind of separate from the from the wall can definitely add uh, some cost and complexity for for uh, builders. Um, having a timber frame done for you, um, you know, it's a it's a cost um, that that has to be factored into the budget. If you want to do it yourself, there's a certain learning curve you're going to have to undertake. There's a certain skill level you need to be able to frame like that. Um, it adds additional time to the build. Essentially, you, you know, you're building um, a, a frame that could stand on its own and surrounding with walls that can stand on their own. So you're kind of doing a, a, a double build there. If you take the easy route, like I was told when I built my first house, which was don't learn how to timber frame, just use these metal brackets. And I go, okay, I'll use the metal brackets, which ended up costing like $300 each and being, you know, a, a cost that, that nobody was aware about front. Um, and you'll likely need a structural engineer. You'll see that ends up on the cautionary items for most of these systems. With um, good reason. With good reason. Because <laughs> without them, buildings fall down. <laughs> That's right. And they're nothing but a pain. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so we can move on. So, yeah, um, I'm going to go through these pretty quickly so that we can get to the discussion part at the end. And these are in no particular order other than as I started looking at photos, I did, you know, every time I saw one uh, or found plans or whatever, uh, that's what came up. So there's no, um, no sense to the order so far. It's not a ranking. So the sort of classic load bearing or Nebraska style um, has framing just at, at the openings, has some sort of wooden roof bearing assembly that, that, uh, that the roof sits on, which if you look around, those get built in wildly different ways. They usually feature some kind of tie-down strap to make a connection from the, from the foundation to the, to the roof bearing plate. And uh, running bond stacking is pretty key to, you know, just getting a feasible wall to, uh, to stand up with this. And so upsides, um, the construction is quite simple. Um, you know, the bales are, you know, the, the, the main element. You're not sort of putting them through, around, behind, in front of, or, you know, sort of interfacing them with much except door and window frames. Um, designed well, you can use a really minimal amount of wood. Um, minimal thermal bridging. And it's pretty easy to air seal because essentially, you know, the plaster is really continuous except for, for, uh, for door and window openings. On the cautionary side, uh, the main reason people don't do this is there's no roof protection during the bale work phase. So um, you can either be exposed to the elements or you put some time and effort into tarps or other kind of ways to, uh, to keep the water off. You can see on that building we just... Uh, draped some plastic over some sticks and made a little roof. That was pretty fast and easy way of doing it. The compression strapping is not necessarily hard to do, but it's a weird thing. You know, chances are, unless you've been to a workshop or done it, nobody's done it, and so you're kind of on your own to, you know, make sure you get that figured out and, and, uh, and do it properly. The roof bearing assemblies often end up uh, being really oversized. You see all kinds of, you know, gigantic beams at the, at the tops of these walls that, uh, that make them a little bit awkward and, and a bit expensive. It can be difficult to stack your walls nice and plumb and straight because there is no framing in the corners and stuff to act as guides. So, you know, often you, you end up creating those things temporarily to make it all happen. Plastering at the roof bearing assembly is a real weak point for air sealing and, and a sort of a, a crack prone place, um, so there are ways to address that, but that, that's something that happens often. And look, you're likely to require a structural <laughs> engineer. <laughs> okay, this next one is box beam framing. So this is um, essentially, I don't know how clear this is to people at the back, but you're making a, a post that's the width of the bale wall. It's typically like two, a pair of two by fours or a pair of two by threes, sort of sandwiched in plywood. Um, so that the, the post is the, the width of the wall and it's going up and, and there's a, a roof bearing plate that's also the width of the wall, so you're creating a frame. And you're making these posts um, to be essentially the door window frames and sometimes at the corners, so it's a, a fairly minimal amount of framing, um, um, but it's a weird style of framing, you're sort of building these composite posts. 
Um, upsides, again, roof protection because you have a frame. Um, the frame provides a really good guide for bale stacking because it, it's everything is in line with the with the face of the bales. Um, no notching of bales. The frame can be quite minimal. It's uh, there's not a lot of, of uh, posts or a lot of a big amount of wood in it. Um, the posts are pretty easy to fabricate, um, and there's little to no stuffing required because all the elements are the same size as the bales. So um, there's no sort of weird spots that uh, that need to be addressed. On the cautionary side, um, it's a lot of plywood or OSB, and if you're watching your embodied energy count, that can drive it up um, quite a bit. Um, there's some degree of thermal bridging at each post, so maybe not you know as energy efficient as um, as ones where the the um, there isn't a, a post going all the way through. If you want the sort of naturally rounded window opening aesthetic, you can achieve it with this, but but it's not inherent in the system. Inherent is a sort of squared window opening unless you spend some, some time and energy kind of faking uh, a round opening. And well, look, you might need a structural engineer. <laughs> this is a paid advertisement? Yeah. <laughs> they should just, just have your logo yeah. at the bottom of each of those yeah, phone number. Yeah. Um, Okay, so this is um, this one is essentially just building a typical stud wall, either 16 inches on center or 24 inches on center, and either um, notching the bales uh, to fit around that frame, or um, you'll see on the illustration on the next page, uh, whacking them to go around it. Um, but completely conventional frame, so double top plate studs, um, and you're sort of fitting the bales into the stud. So um, you know the stud ends up. Uh, flush with the face of the bales, typically on the outside of the building. So that's one way we've achieved it, and it works really well, is we dip the bales in a clay slip, and then hi them with a 2x4, which happens to leave a perfect 2x4 depth and width slot um, that goes into the wall. Um, so this system also gives you roof protection during framing, or during baling. It's a code compliant framing system, so you may not need a structural engineer depending on who who the building official is because you're doing something that you know is straight out of the code in terms of the uh, the structural frame. Uh, the frame provides a great guide for the bale stacking because you're you know there are studs everywhere and and getting it all lined up is good and uh, there's a little bit of awkwardness at the top of the wall, the depth the three inches of the top plate, so there's a little bit of stuffing, but it's it's fairly minimal. Um, on the cautionary side, the, the notching and, and the, the karate chopping of the bales adds time. Um, the, the, the two by four whack doesn't take a lot of time, but you do, you know, you have to know where you're whacking it, so you're actually stopping and measuring and doing all that kind of stuff, so it, it definitely uh, slows the process down some. Um, when we did it, we found that the bales um, might need sort of tying to the frame that um, there was a tendency to, when they got up towards the top, to, to sort of lean away from the frame a bit. So again, there's a, a little bit of time involved in that. And the biggest drawback was that the corners uh, are sort of awkward to bail, because if, if you have only a, a 16 or 24 inch center, and then you turn the corner and there's another one of those, like the one bail goes in, but what happens to the little space when you're you know, trying to go the other way? It's not a huge thing to overcome, but it, uh, you know, it was just a... a Something that you want to figure out how are you going to do that. You might change the framing at the corners to make it work, but um, it doesn't work perfectly well without some forethought. Okay, so this is an odd one, uh, and to the best of my knowledge, we did it once, and it's probably the only time it's ever been done. But it was pretty cool, so I thought I'd put it in, and that is we made um, waste wood columns. So the 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 agenda for this building was to either pick it up off the ground on this nature site where we were or find it for free. So um, we made um, columns that were the same width as the bales and we did it by, um, well, a bunch of different ways, raiding um, other construction sites for their scrap pieces of wood, which, you know, they tend to get thrown out when they reach a certain shortness, um, so they're no good for this way posts but we put them like one, two, three, and then turned the other way and went one, two, three, and one, two, three, and one, two, three, and, brrr, and built these things up. Um, 
and we could build them the same width as the wall. So we thought that was um, a good way to go. And then we used a fairly typical sort of load-bearing style top plate um, across across the top. And then so that's that's what one of them looked like going up. So at the bottom, we found offcuts from a manufactured log home place that they threw out. So we use those. And then there's some deadfall that we picked up off the ground and chopped up. And then towards the top, we're into the two by fours and two by sixes that we found. Um, so upsides, again, like any frame, you get the roof on before you bail. Um, the salvage material reduces the sort of cost and embodied energy. And the frame can be made to match the width of the bales, whether you're going flat or, you know, on edge or whatever size you happen to be working with. You can just cut those pieces of waste to match that size. Yeah, they're all nailed together. Yeah, and uh, um, he's in the process of sort of packing hempcrete into the spaces to um, sort of deal with some of this. You know, there obviously there is thermal bridging where those frame members are because you've got wood running from from inside to outside. Um, it was definitely easy for the columns to end up a little bit off plumb because by the time you <laughs> get to the top, it's uh, it be uh, easy to remedy, but you know, it's something to take into account. Um, Definitely requires a structural engineer. <laughs> and uh, the column construction, I mean, it was surprisingly fast, but, you know, depending on how many of them you're making, it's a, it's a lot of individual pieces to, uh, to handle. So that was that one. Uh, another one-off oddball, but this one I would like to repeat as many times as I can, and that is uh, using round bales as structural columns. So basically making posts, but out of the, out of the big rounds. Um, and then infilling with the rectangular bales. And again, so we used a, a load-bearing style uh, roof-bearing plate to, uh, to join them. Uh, well, so there, there it is. So that's the, that's the column stack. Um, and thanks to uh, Colin and his team at Queens, they tested this in the lab. They were really strong. I don't remember the number. I'm thinking it was like 140 kilonewtons per column or something like that, um, because the the round bales are just way more dense and compact than than the than the rectangulars ever are, um, and big, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a big column, yeah. It's got a good width to height ratio. It makes engineers happy. <laughs> um, so the upsides of doing it this way was that the construction was very fast. That's only. Well, if you want an eight-foot ceiling, it's only two bales, but we went 12, so it's three high. Um, again, we were able to, to build the roof. And the, the rounds aren't nearly as susceptible to, you don't worry about them as much um, in the rain. Um, they, they shed water better because of their shape, and there's just so much more straw, they don't get uh, saturated. Um, the round bales are a lot lower in cost, so a, a big round um, costs about $25. Um, and there's about the equivalent of 30, 35 rectangles in it. So it's, you know, um, it's a cheap way to get straw, and, and they're actually easier to find than, than rectangles. Um, not only is there no thermal bridging with that framing system, but there's sort of uh, extra insulation uh, where the frame is. Um, the plastering is really nice because it's, it's just everything is straw so you're not you're not crossing unlike elements you don't have sort of wood that you that you're really worrying about uh, getting over um, no notching of bales um, unique aesthetic yep it was a unique aesthetic <laughs> um, and one thing that that we haven't explored but um, I have talked to a few farmers the the rounds can be made much smaller than than that four foot diameter so they can be rolled as small as 24 28 inches so um, you know it other could suit. Are, What's that? Other columns are possible. Yes, other columns are possible. Yeah. How different is the foundation that you have to do there to match that? Well, in this case, we were doing an earth bag foundation. So uh, we just made the beauty of earth bags is you just make them whatever shape the thing you happen to want to put on them is. So we just made these earth bag donuts um, and then joined them with straight runs of bag uh, for the uh, for the straight walls. So cautionary items, the thickness of the column requires a unique footing. Um, one thing that I realized uh, that would work with these two is um, a lot of tractor tires are exactly that size. So like a tractor tire would make a good um, Rambert sort of tire footing. 
Um, the, the roof plate um, interface with the column, um, you know, it sort of changes shape. Um, so there's some details that need to be figured out there. And it will require a structural engineer. Although we have some good testing data from, uh, from Queens to, if anybody wants to repeat this, um, we could definitely share that data. When you were going up three high, did you drive down, down through the, the round bales or anything? Um, you can see, there, there's one there. On the outside, at first we, we just tried to take the tractor and put them one, two, three, but the tractor we had was on its tippy toes trying to get the third one on and just getting it lined up. So we actually made those columns lying down. We just pushed the bales into each other, put some one by fours. Do we use like three one by fours around the outside? And some strapping. So so they were columns lying down, which then just got stood up. Nothing running through them. Nothing running through them, no. The structural engineers did with Yeah. It wasn't Tim in this case. No. <laughs> but I still yeah. Yeah. I don't like Dallas to do Yeah. Okay. And those one by four just What's that? We just blasted over them. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you could take them off. Yeah. Yeah. They, I don't think they're really doing much other than making it convenient to stand the whole thing up. Yeah. So what about the Nothing. Nothing. We, 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 so we built that um, and built the roof on the ground and put the roof on the thing. And we, we couldn't even measure an amount of, of settling that happened when we put the, the roof on those bales. So it, it's, uh, they're a whole different game than, than the little bales. Yeah. Rob helped build this one so he can... Uh, <laughs> At that point, there was a slip on the bales and there wasn't even a hairline crack into the place at all. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love that for that reason. It was, and it was crazy fast. Like these things were up, and the roof plate was on, and it was ready for a roof really, really quickly. Um, yeah. Uh, so this one is uh, double stud framing using the the length of a straw bale to set the centers for the framing. Um, so it's a, a sort of conventional style um, with you know two by fours or two by sixes and a double top plate, but but just the, the spacing is weird. I think you were talking about this very system earlier on. Yeah, so. but the yeah, balloon framing is what we use. Right, yeah. Um, and only one side. Maybe okay, one. okay. Um, so anyway, that's, that's what it looks like. So a stud wall inside and outside of matching. Upsides, again, roof protection. Um, it's, it's a, would you call it code component construction? I mean, I think... Um, did, you're probably stretching it on the spacing, but it, it's the kind of thing that that sh to me should be coming to meet our new, like our increasing SB12 double stud cellulose, like that. But it, most jurisdictions would still ask you to come right. through. Okay. Yeah. It's damn close. So put may require structural engineer. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, Again, the bale walls are sort of uninterrupted by the frame, so there's no notching. You're, you're basically you know, stacking a, a column of bales in this, in this thing. Um, the frame is a great guide uh, because it's on both sides. Um, things stack really easily. Um, this system's really great because it, it also gives you uh, attachment points if you want to side the building or, or for you know, cabinetry or anything like that inside the, the frames in both places. Um, very little sort of stuffing or filling that needs to happen. On the cautionary side, you know, you're building two frames, so you're taking twice as much um, time to do it. In terms of wood use, uh, the way we do these, we do a 2 by 4 wall on the outside and a 2 by 3 on the inside. So total amount of wood, 6 inches, whereas if you're doing a 2 by 6 wall, you'd be using 5.5 total inches of wood. So it's actually not that much more wood use than, than a conventional building, um, but you are framing two walls, so there's that time. If, you, if you're using bigger dimension lumber, um, then, then your lumber count will go up. And again, it's, you know, you have to detail if you want roundy window openings because there's a, a, a post on the inside and the outside that the natural shape of a door window opening is, uh, is squared off. Right, yeah, yeah. 
Um, straw cell, so this is something, uh, those of you who are here, was it last year that David presented on this, or two years ago? Okay, so anyway, uh, we like the look of that, so we actually just finished a project doing this. Um, so this is making a totally normal stud wall that goes around the outside of the building, um, stacking your bales up against that stud wall on the inside, and filling the stud cavity with cellulose. Um, so that's, uh, that's what that system is. Um, the, the reasons for doing it, or their reasons, um, the, the natural framework, or new frameworks guys, was that um, they were looking for a bit more insulation value, so the cellulose, the addition of the cellulose gave them that, and they were looking for a no exterior plaster um, you know, type arrangement. So typically, if a straw bale building gets sided, it gets plastered, and then get sided on top of the plaster, which is sort of a, a double time and double money uh, issue. So this one, you know, the outside is, is sided, but there was no need to plaster because um, the cellulose is out there. So, well, the the idea here is that is that the cellulose is fire rated, um, so you know a fire would have to start in the cellulose in order to start the straw, so, you know, it, uh, it's not as likely. Yeah. Um, so when we did this, the upsides we found, again, the roof was on. Um, this was sort of 100%, you know, code compliant framing. Um, the bale walls, again, it, st it was more like doing a load bearing stacking job because um, there was only really small um, frames for the windows and doors that we had to uh, to put in there. Um, the additional R value uh, meant that for the building we did this year we could meet passive house standards, um, which you know a, a, a regular bale wall doesn't quite do um, in most cases. And the no exterior plaster um, is you know for some people a good thing, for some people not what you would want, but um, this was a commercial building for clients that sort of had no interest in ever having to maintain this building, so it's much easier to give a, a sided finish than a, um, than a plaster one if that's what you're after. On the cautionary side, um, it's wider than a typical bale wall, so you're, you know, whatever the, whether you're using a 2x4 or 2x6 stud, that's now on top of the, uh, of the width of a bale, so it gets to be a pretty uh, wide wall system. Um, there's additional material required for sheathing, strapping, and siding. So if you're looking at embodied energy, you know, that will all add up to a lot more than, say, uh, a coat of earth plaster. Um, the, the, the bale and cellulose combo doesn't have, there's not a whole lot of track record in terms of, you know, I feel quite confident doing it, but I can't point to an example that's even more than three or four years old and say, look, see, it works for a long time. Um, so. You know, it, it is it is untested. Um, the dense pack cellulose is not, that's not, you can't do that with the machine you rent from Home Depot or Home Hardware. You need somebody with a with a high-powered blower to, to install it dense pack, so you are looking at sort of having to, to hire that out. Um, and interestingly, you know, we're so used with, with straw bale walls about, you know, having some concern with keeping them dry from, uh, protect them from the rain. The cellulose is actually more vulnerable than the straw was, so we were, a bit, you know, uh, a little more paranoid about uh, about covering it up than uh, than we were with the straw. But it is, you know, because we're we're you know sheathing it, um, it you can cover it pretty quickly. But that that is something you have to take into account. Is that sort of yeah. Is that vapor barrier on the exterior? Can you back up, Terrell, and? Is that vapor barrier, like that he's blowing the cellulose yeah. into? No, that's the, um, the uh, gauze-like stuff that they use for dense packing. So the air can come out and the cellulose stays in. Yeah. The sheeting, the sheeting is um, a wood fiber board from from Quebec. Um, so like a half inch. Yeah. Uh, the reason we used it. Um, is it has a better perm rating than any of the plasters we would ever use on a bale wall. So yeah, I think 28 or something like that, like really high. So it, it keeps... Yep. 
Structural? Structural enough. Structural enough. Yeah. Ish. <laughs> yeah. Ish. It, I mean, it has, it has actually like a, a rating that's, yeah. you know, code compliant rating, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. No, it's, well, the building had great geometry. It rounded ends so that that really helps a lot with dispersing lateral loads. Right. If you avoid 90 degree corners, you really avoid stress concentration. So. There's a yeah, we had a timber frame in each corner. Yeah, and, also and had, yeah it was, it was, was uh, pretty flexible bomber. Net, round, round corners, is it flexible to get around these round yeah. corners? Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, bent around that quite easily. Uh, okay, so this next one is sort of uh, doing something with a, uh, a completely external frame or an exoset, exoskeleton. Um, so this uh, we did because this was the plan for my mom's house, which you'll notice does not have a lot of straight walls in it. <laughs> and even the walls that look straight on the plans, they got mixed. They had to be more rounded than that. So we were faced with, well, how do you put a roof, a practical roof on something with a shape like that? And the answer was build a really straight square sort of pavilion kind of roof that sits over the whole thing and then build the walls underneath. Um, so you've got a frame, but the, the actual bail walls are completely separate from the frame. And the, the frame is taking, you know, the, the majority of the, if not all of the, the structural loads. Um, so good things about it. Uh, again, we've got the roof up first. Um, like a timber frame, well, it is sort of a timber frame, um, it sort of outlasts or could outlast the, the walls. So you can take the whole house down under that pavilion and make a new house if you wanted to. Um, the bales are uninterrupted by the frame, so there's no uh, notching. The biggest advantage was it, it allowed for those curving walls, but with a simple uh, roof shape. Um, it was an easy way to get lots of um, overhangs and porch space. Um, and it sort of, it, it could for some owner builders, I know some people who've, who've mimicked this one, did it because they were able to build in stages. So in one season they could go, get the piers in, get the thing up, put the roof on, and that was a viable structure that they could walk away from and then come back the following year and, and, uh, and put the bales up underneath it. Um, the main cautionary item on this one is that, you know, you're now building two completely separate foundation systems. So, you know, there's a lot of foundation work and, uh, and, and definitely some, you know, additional costs um, in, doing, in doing the foundation that way. Modified post and beam. I would have to say, of all these things we've talked about, this is this is the only one that I would s try to steer people away from. And it, it for some reason, it seems to be, when I look around, especially in the U.S., the most common thing that people do, and I'm not sure why, but it's it's sort of making uh, a frame, usually by laminating a couple two by fours or two by sixes together as posts on like four, six, eight foot centers, and then having um, like a fairly deep beam. I don't know what the size of that one is, but that sits out at the outside edge of the wall. Um, so if we go to the pictures, um, you get a roof up and, uh, and that's great. Um, the post and beam is fairly simple to put together. Um, it's all just dimensional lumber nailed together. Um, but cautionary items, and I think these ones are really important. This thing takes a crazy amount of bail notching. Uh, these pictures are from um, I was just in Utah last week, and this is the style they're building. And with their group of 10 students, they spent four days notching bales to go around this frame, which to me seems a little crazy. So there's a lot of bale notching. And then at the top of the wall, there's this beam that's not a full bale high. So then they have to cut this funny shape into a bale where it's like, you know, you've got four inches of the bale, and then you've got to put a cut in this way, and then a cut up and then push it in and then try to get it to stay there and it's a really awkward fit and again takes them a long time and there ends up being a lot of stuffing and, and sort of fussing around there. And then you have a big exposed beam on the outside um, that requires sort of meshing and is a, a, a place that's really prone to, uh, to cracking. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to put everything in terms of upsides and cautionary items and for everything else I sort of feel like these things can be balanced out I really don't think this is a good way to go. I've seen so many people spend so much time messing around with this design, and there's so many easier ways to do it um, that I just wouldn't go there. <coughs> Editorializing. Um, so this is actually two 
different systems, but they look very similar, so I put them in the same slide. One is, uh, again, like, like we looked at some stud wall variations where the stud wall is on bale centers. Um, this is using a single stud wall but centering it in the, uh, in the middle of the bale wall rather than having it on the outside or the inside or having two. It's doing one and putting it in the middle, um, which sort of buries the frame so you're not um, having to um, cover up the wood or worry about plastering over the wood or anything like that. But it's also the basis for Tom Riven's cell under tension um, way of building, where he does the same stud pattern, but then he uses um, what he calls baguettes, but basically um, hardwood one by twos or or something of those of that nature, and he kind of compresses the bale down and then screws those into the stud, so the the cell under tension, um, so then you know the strings are cut on the bale and it's, it's sort of being wedged in with those, um, and so it's the, the whole thing is, uh, is sort of compressed as you, as you go up. With the various stuff, does that eliminate thermal bridging? With the, um, yeah, hardly any of these, only the, only the one with the, the box beam post really has any thermal bridging. Everything else, you know, where there's wood, it's, it's, there's still a lot of straw from the wood to one side of the building or the other, so. Um, so uh, if you build it like a stud frame, you would get the roof up first, um, but if you do it um, the cut method, you, you're basically building up as you go so the, the wall's exposed, so depending you know, which style you use, that's either a, a, an upside or a downside. Um, it, it really minimizes uh, the wood um, thermal bridging. Cautionary items, if you, know, if you do it the cut way, there is no roof. Um, the, the window framing, because the, the stud is centered, the window, the natural window framing ends up in the middle of the wall, which is awkward in our climate because you sort of want water to be shedding to the outside, so it sometimes means extending the frame or building additional frames uh, at the openings. Um, and the, doing the baguettes, um, you know, add some time and, and complexity to, uh, to putting the wall up. And here we are, we're hit number 12. So um, the last one is a, is a sort of prefab straw bale panel. And, and it's sort of using a, a, a light frame to surround each panel. Um, essentially, this is identical to the load bearing one we looked at right at the beginning, except you build it lying flat and off-site, um, or you build it lying flat in place and you, and you tip it up. Um, and the biggest change is that by lying it flat, you're able to, to put both the interior and exterior plaster on the wall uh, in one coat while it's lying horizontal. So uh, it really cuts down on the labor time. So upsides are, you, you know, you don't have a roof on when you put the, the walls in, but the walls are, the straw is protected by the plaster. Um, before there's a roof, so it, it's much less of a worry. Um, you can do really minimal uh, framing. You're not dependent on weather conditions when you're plastering. You end up with straight plumb walls, and the plastering is, uh, is one coat, and you don't really need to know what you're doing. If you can hold one side of a 2 by 4 and shake it back and forth, you get a, a really good um, straight finish on the wall. On the cautionary side, they're heavy. Uh, an eight by eight weighs about a ton, so you're you know you need equipment to make this work. Um, you have to figure out how to seal between the panels when you when you assemble them on site. Um, you also have to figure out um, sort of non-conventional tie down methods to the foundation because the your essentially your sill plates are part of the wall when it gets set on the foundation, so J bolts and that kind of stuff uh, aren't an option. Um, and it really makes sense to design the building to be convenient for panels if you're going to build a panel building. So, you know, um, it's not really convenient to build a one foot three wide panel to, you know, go between this door and that window or something. So you, you kind of want to make uh, a building that, that suits panelization. But yeah, essentially they just get craned in and, and put in place. Okay, so um, that was all the systems, and what I want to do, and there is some time, um, and even if, even if here we don't have a ton of time to discuss, 
it might kickstart some good discussions uh, over the bar, which opens in 10 minutes. <laughs> um, so as I was thinking about this, you know, each of these systems has things that you have to think about and you kind of have to get right to make it work. Um, but regardless of the system, there are also things that I think um, are generally important if you want to make happy bailers at the end of the process. And uh, so I've listed some of these and maybe people have other thoughts that, uh, that, that we can sort of talk about now. But one that I find all the time is that so often the height of the wall does not correspond to the size of the bales. So you're going up and you have put in course number six and you go to put in course number seven and it's either this far away from the top plate or it's this much taller than the top plate and suddenly you're spending a day and a half notching, stuffing, chainsawing, whatever, however it is you're going to figure that out, it's a pain in the butt and so, you know, happy bailers just put their last course in and it fits snugly and they walk away smiling and the people that, that spend, you know, huge amounts of time to get, you know, uh, uh, definitely once you're into stuffing or cutting bales, a lesser result um, tend not to be happy bailers. Um, proper air sealing details need to be considered for all of these systems. Um, so looking at, uh, you know, how do you stop leakage where plaster comes to windows, floors, ceilings, all that kind of stuff. And this little set of photos, um, this is something we came across this year, but uh, the company Sega makes a, a tape and it's made for plastering over. And we thought that was pretty cool. It's meant to sort of attach to framing and then go on to, they, they actually intend it for sort of um, block or brick or things like that. But the stuff is so sticky, it sticks to straw. <laughs> so we could like make a, a awesome tape seal and the tape is fuzzy, so plaster sticks to it and then it has holes so plaster goes through it. And this was a million times faster than anything we used to do with lath and mesh and all that kind of stuff. So just looking for those sorts of things, you know, that, that helps a lot. Um, anything where you can get away from notching and modifying bales makes for happy balers. Um, detailing for plaster stops. So, so many bale buildings I go and see, everything looks great, the bale work looks great, and then people start standing there with mud on the trowels and it's like, where does it go? <laughs> is it supposed to go around and like actually stick on the window? Does it butt up to the window? Just all that kind of stuff so often isn't taken into account. And when it is, things go smooth and fast. And when it isn't, it looks crappy in the end and, and frustrates everybody. Uh, window flashing details are important in any kind of building. So regardless of the system, um, if you can nail that down simply, that's good. Um, Allowance for uneven bales and plaster. So many times plans call for like a straw bale is 18 inches wide and the plaster will be three quarters of an inch on either side and then really the bales are kind of fuzzy and they're actually 19 inches but suddenly things don't work. You know, the, the timber frame is there and now the bales hang out of, you know, beyond the side of the wall and you're into tons of trimming and stuff. So, you know, giving a little leeway or either knowing exactly your bale dimensions or make the assumption that they're probably a little fuzzier than, than the nice sharp line on the, on the drawing shows. Um, finish details uh, that sort of match the client's um, wishes. You know, we just finished a building where, I don't know, what was there? It was like four stages to trimming out those windows, you know. They're beautiful. It took a long time. But if I was trying to do the fastest, cheapest house for somebody, they would have been very upset with me and, you know, that wouldn't have been the right thing to do. So making sure that, you know, the, the degree to which this already very custom wall thing has to be further customized um, can make for either happy or sad clients. Um, and try to take out as many steps as you can, you know. Um, there are still people driving rebar stakes down the middle of bales something that most people said, well, we don't need to do that 20 years ago, but there are still people spending hundreds of dollars on rebar and cutting them to lengths and standing on walls and trying to smack them down. So, yeah, <laughs> dangerous uh, you know, for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, can you get away without meshing the building entirely? You know, we haven't meshed a building in a really long time. There's another whole step and another process, and another cost that tends to make people sort of sad once you've stood at a bale wall and stitched for four days. Um, 
uh, make sure this has nothing to do with the, the, the actual plans of the building, but you know, simplify the storage and handling of bales, you know, so that they're not coming to the site and, and getting taken off a truck and put on this big stack, and then once it's ready, then they go from this stack to the floor of the house, and then from the floor of the house, you know, um, get them brought to you in a container, get the container dropped and, you know, take them out when you need them, that sort of thing. And this is where I thought, you know, this would be a good time because we have lots of people in the in the room who have lots of experience. Like, what other things can we do to make sure that um, we end up with happy happy bailers, happy owners, happy contractors? Just to say that, you know, when when somebody likes their straw bale project, when the builder's happy and or the client is happy, that makes for more projects. You know, the the, the recommendation is everything to us in this business right now. Um, and when somebody is not a happy bailer, then the, you know, it, it hurts everybody um, because you know, people are more looking for reasons. When you're presenting them with something new or interesting or innovative, they're much more prone to accept reasons not to do it than to do it. You know, there's the odd convert who jumps in and just thinks this is great and I'm in and this is probably all of us in Ontario <laughs> are in the room right now who are who are that type of person and everybody else you know they're they're spending their 200 300 400 thousand dollars and it doesn't take more than one person saying no that wasn't good like that took too long it cost too much it was too awkward I got too itchy picking the bales up so many times whatever it happens to be um, really puts a dent in you know how often the, the phone rings for people who do this for a living. So uh, we want to, you know, avoid that. And I think one thing, because we are people who like this, we're prone to forgiving some of the awkwardness of working with straw bales. We're prone to thinking, oh, that was fine. Like, so we spent three days chainsawing bales. Like, that was great. You know, we had some friends, there were some beers, we cut some with the chainsaw, it was all good. That's that's an advocate's point of view, and it's it's a valid point of view, but it's not most people who are looking for a house. And so, you know, if if you want to be able to you know continue doing this, you those those things that we see as like slight limitations or mixed results or something like that, to other people are like stay away, don't do this. So if we can minimize those, uh, the better. Um, so you know, how can we provide people with with really good results for you know their investment in in this idea and you know cost per square foot again it's it depends so much on that client's criteria for some people cost per square foot drives the whole project and it's all about that and they'll go with whatever's the lowest and for some people they'll they're willing to balance that off against a certain aesthetic or a certain low embodied energy or a certain you know so it's kind of knowing what what it is you're selling and then making sure that's what you're providing once you've said, you know, yes, I can do it. So, I mean, one of the interesting things for me that came out of doing the, the Making Better Buildings book is when I was doing the embodied energy analysis, I decided to look at a straw bale wall two ways, one with earth plaster and one with a cement line plaster. The earth plaster one, I think, was either the lowest or one of the very lowest embodied energy building systems in the whole book. The exact same wall with a lime cement plaster was was either the highest or, or right up with the highest embodied energy things in the whole book. So here we are telling a client, yes, our straw bale wall is extremely low in embodied energy. Is it? Like which one of those two are you doing? If you know if you're and there's reasons to do cement lime plaster, I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but if you're selling a client low embodied energy, you should be doing low embodied energy. If you're selling a client low wood use, you should be doing low wood use. If you're selling a client, this is really easy for you to do yourself, you don't need anybody to help you, then it should be a system that's easy to do for themselves. So that's, so that's sort of what I'm you know, trying to get here is that these approaches, there's good and bad points to all of them. It's like figuring out so which, which thing suits this, this particular client. You know, you, you don't give the first time ever home builder, uh, sure, I'll design you a round timber frame with turrets. You know, <laughs> it's like, that's a fine building. It's it's a valid building, but it's not the right building for that person. So, um, you know, 
we want people to be looking like that when they're done their project. And so, you know, we want to choose a system that really matches uh, what what uh, what we're promising that client in the first place. So, the end. Bam. Oh no, I went a few minutes over, but. Uh, <laughs>